Welcome to today's episode of the Working Wisdom Podcast Series, brought to you by the C.T. Bauer College of Business at the University of Houston. We're having a conversation about work-life balance, how to navigate and overcome challenges within your career, and how to make business more accommodating to a diverse workforce. Hi, I'm Vivian. I'm a marketing and entrepreneurship recent graduate from the Bauer College, and we're here with our Working Wisdom podcast with Professor Melanie Rudd. It's great to be here for the podcast and I'm excited to talk about some of my research. Yes, exactly. So Melanie Rudd has done a lot of research in terms of time perception and kind of, um, I think it's called affects, like emotions. And um, specifically, she did a research on awe, which not a lot of people know that there's a science behind awe and how that affects daily life. (laughs) Could you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, even within research, it was a relatively new emotion to study. You see a lot of research on things like happiness or Mm -hmm. sadness and disgust. But when I started doing this research, there was very little on the emotion awe. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we tend to think that the emotion awe is something you experience very rarely. You know, we kind of view it as this emotion that you put on a pedestal, like, oh, I experience awe a couple times in my life. And and really, that's not necessarily the case. Just like other emotions like happiness, you can feel kind of happy today or really happy today. You can kind of have the same effect with awe. You can mm-hmm. experience a little bit or a lot. So uh, the emotion awe is seemingly mysterious, but with a lot of new research, we're really starting to decode it and start to understand okay. what makes up awe and what does it do for us as humans. Okay, can you scientifically clarify what awe is? Yes. Uh, (laughs) Awe is largely a positive emotion, Mm -hmm. and it's characterized as having kind of two defining features or characteristics. So the first ingredient that you need to experience awe is perceptual vastness which refers to the sense that you've encountered something immense. And it's not necessarily something physically big, that that counts too, Mm -hmm. but it's also something immense in size, number, scope, complexity, ability, or social bearing, like fame or authority or power. And the second ingredient that you really need in order to have awe is you have to experience what's called a need for accommodation, which is kind of a fancy way of saying you need to feel that something is difficult for you to mentally grasp. It it challenges your mental structures and it alters how you experience or think about the world. So if you have those two pieces, then you can experience awe. Okay, you you said earlier that awe could be something on the small end as well as something um, like magical and mystical. Could you give like some examples? Sure, Uh, so even something as small as seeing a very awe-inspiring photo or a picture. So like okay. for me, I purposely set like my screensaver on my computer to show different awe-inspiring pictures of nature because I can get my little doses of awe throughout the day whenever okay. my, my screensaver comes on. But you can have little pictures, you can have little moments where you, you see something or observe someone else that elicits awe. And then you can have bigger things like, you know, you have a special trek to Nepal to go see Mount Everest at base camp. You know, Mm -hmm. that obviously that's very awe-inspiring to see Mount Everest, but you don't necessarily need to go to Mount Everest every day to get your daily dose of awe. Okay, okay. So um, even like pictures of dogs, (laughs) I'm assuming gives you some awe. For instance, if the dog does some kind of really crazy, amazing trick that makes you go, how is that possible? How is that that physically possible for the dog to do that? Then that could potentially, in you, trigger a sense of awe. And then what does awe do? So there's a lot of cool research out there that shows some effects of awe. So Mm -hmm. there's some research done by other other researchers that look at the things like awe makes people feel more humble, awe makes people Mm -hmm. feel small and connected to the broader world. In my research, I've so far really focused on two kind of big consequences. So the first is that awe can expand people's perceptions of time and actually make it feel like they have more time available. Uh, The second kind of big consequence is that Awe tends to make people feel more open to the prospect of learning, which my research shows makes them really want to create, kind of get bit by the creation bug and want to uh, dig in and uh, and make things and, and actually physically create. 
Okay, so you're also a professor as well as doing research. So I'm wondering, do you get, do you use awe during your lectures? Well, sometimes uh, I do try and insert some awe-inspiring imagery okay. in my uh, lecture slides. So especially in the first uh, slide of the day where I have my title slide, mm -hmm. I usually try and look at something that may be a little bit awe-inspiring if I can, can sneak it in there. Um, but hopefully, maybe, uh, the knowledge that I give the students during the <laughs> lectures could be awe-inspiring, so maybe I can inspire awe through that as well. Yeah, so actually as some background, I took her applied buyer behavior class, I think, maybe sophomore or junior year, mm -hmm. um, and there was specifically one thing that I still remember today. It was an experiment on pudding, <laughs> and yes. I, can't, I can't describe it too well, and I don't want to um, like mess up exactly how it worked, but... Could you explain that for the listeners? It was an experiment in class about how people's perceptions don't always match reality. Okay. <laughs> and it's one of those things where um, students, if I were to tell them ahead of time that this is true, they wouldn't believe me. Mm -hmm. And it tends to blow their mind in a bit to show how easily we judge things based on our you know, ears, eyes, uh, nose, mouth, and our senses, and how we often... Uh, I don't want to spoil it too much in case there's students who are listening, <laughs> but um, one of those things where it's it's not things are not always what they appear to be. So I also wanted to talk about um, kind of how we can apply this to companies or how um, companies or businesses who want to expand time perception for the employees, have them work a little more productively, more creatively. How how can we use this? Yeah, well. You know, in our experiments, we found that it was possible to elicit awe in a variety of different ways. So we've done it through commercials. Okay. We've done it through recall tasks where they remember an event. We've done it through just imagery in like posters or other advertisements. So there's a lot of different ways that you can elicit awe during the day if you want to. And, and companies nowadays, I mean, even think about the office buildings that they create. A lot of them are designed to be very awe-inspiring. Mm -hmm. The architecture of buildings, mm -hmm alone is something that is very good at inspiring awe. And so, you know, a lot of companies, they want to inspire awe, but they don't really know necessarily what it does and how to harness it. So knowing that awe can expand people's perception of time, there are certainly times and activities uh, at work where that's a beneficial thing, you know, especially when people are kind of in the zone where they need to think carefully and really be in a nice space where they don't feel rushed or hurried. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of tasks that are just more difficult to do when you're in a kind of a rushed mindset. There's other times, of course, when, when you want people to hurry, <laughs> you know, if something is due at a certain quick deadline mm -hmm. or if on a production line or something. So the companies need to realize when it may or may not be beneficial to expand perceptions of time and use it strategically in that way. Same thing, if awe is able to expand people's openness to learning and make them want to create, then that might be a great thing to incorporate into whatever department they have for you know, their marketing or their creative folks because they want to inspire those feelings in that office space. So imagery or having uh, people keep a diary for awe experiences, anything they can do to encourage the employees to really pay attention to and seek out awe is important because oftentimes we just don't seek it out mm -hmm. and it's there we just aren't focused on. Okay so we're gonna actually take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. Join the conversation. Bauer College's Working Families Initiative is bridging the gap between industry and academia to create a conversation on how organizations can make the workplace more family friendly. We're talking about flexibility, maternity and paternity leave, and career transitions. For more information about the Working Families Initiative at Bauer College, including upcoming events, visit bauer.uh.edu slash working families. And we're back from the break, still sitting here, still talking about awe and um, your research on that. Um, you also said that kind of your research on the science of awe kind of led you to study the desire to create, right? Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, I mean, me personally, I've always been kind of bit by the creativity bug every once in a while. I just kind of get an urge to create something. And even if it's something that I've never done before, like, I want to learn how to knit a sweater. <laughs> I just made a sweater. <laughs> I've never had a hobby before. And I started to wonder why, why do I sometimes just feel the need to create, mm -hmm. you know, just kind of like as an actual urge, a human urge and motivation. And I started looking into it. And there's been a little bit of research that shows certain motivations for, for doing this, but we we don't know a whole lot about what makes people want to create. We know a lot more about 
how to influence people's level of creativity and kind of the output, you know, but we don't really know that much about what motivates people to create. So I was very interested in this and I started connecting it with some of my awe research and I thought, well, gee, you know, if, if awe is able to make you want to accommodate your knowledge and maybe that makes people want to learn and maybe that leads to creation. So that's why I started looking into these kind of research questions to kind of figure this out. And in the business world and the marketing, there's so many products and services out there that really require a consumer needs to want to create, you know, whether it's building an Ikea table or doing a home improvement project in their house, you know, that's, it's really important to have that desire to create um, for a lot of, uh, a lot of marketers and practitioners. So the desire to create, it stems from awe. It well, awe is shown now to be one key Component. potential okay. elicitor of awe. There's mm -hmm. could be many things that might d elicit a desire to create, but awe from an emotional perspective seems to be kind of a very key uh, affect okay. in order to create uh, compared to happiness or excitement or pride or uh, all sorts of other positive emotions. We're finding that awe is the ticket to creativity in that in that domain. I think that makes a lot of sense because I can imagine myself scrolling on Instagram seeing DIYs about how to make candles and all of a sudden I want to make candles. <laughs> yeah, and especially a lot of those websites seem to have very awe-inspiring photos yeah. and imagery when they when they show these things. And so it only potentially feeds more into that desire to create. Wow, okay. So you've published many things, <laughs> which is very exciting. Um, how did you choose this career path? Well, it's kind of a bit of a journey. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it maybe is for many people. Uh, my background uh, growing up, I didn't come from an academic family. Um, I grew up in a very small farm town in Western Washington in the woods. Uh, so, you know, trying to figure out what I wanted to do for my career, I didn't really know exactly when I got to college what I wanted to do. I had a lot of interests and that actually made things challenging because I liked a lot of things you and it was very difficult yeah. to pick what to do. Mm -hmm. I had other friends who were like, oh, I, I like these two really, two things. I'm very interested in these two things and here's a job that applies exactly to this. And so I took courses and I, I decided I was gonna be a business major and I really liked marketing. In particular, I liked the psychology behind marketing. So I initially thought, well, maybe I'll do something that maybe has a job in industry like that. And that was kind of my plan. And then about partway through my time at the university, I had a instructor, another professor, pull me aside and say, hey, did you ever think about getting a PhD in marketing? I said, what the heck is a PhD in marketing? Is that a, that's a thing? I had no idea that that was a possible career path. Uh, you know, you, once you kind of get into a uh, business degree, you know, kind of industry is what is assumed you're going to be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so he pulled me aside and showed me, you know, yeah, you know, all this stuff that you find really interesting, here's research behind it, and we do this. <laughs> so if you're interested in consumer psychology and you have a mind for experiments and math for statistics and all this other stuff, which I did, he's like, why don't you, why don't you see if you're interested in this? And so I spent time uh, as a research assistant with him, working, uh, reading lots of papers, learning to run experiments and getting my hands dirty a bit, uh, and then sent out applications and got accepted to Stanford and moved there. And that's kind of how it all began. So it was a long time getting the degree for five years <laughs> is how long it takes. Uh, oh. And uh, after that, I got to come here to the University of Houston where I got my first job and it's been great. <laughs> Great. Well, go Kooks. Yes. Um, that's our sponsored message for the second. Um, so I also wanted to talk about um, you. You also kind of in class, you talk about purchase decisions mm -hmm. and kind of the process that goes through, which not a lot of people talk about. Um, I think it's it was one of like the key topics behind applied buyer behavior. Um, so I just wanted to ask if you could explain that a little more. Yeah, I mean, we do spend a lot of time in class discussing the consumer decision-making process because it's not simple and it's very complex. Uh, we do have certain uh, lectures where we focus a lot on the different steps in decision-making and we talk a lot about how those steps are different each and every time and some decisions are very almost habitual and done without much conscious awareness and others you spend hours, weeks, months deciding and figuring out what to do. 
And then on top of that, there's all these different outside factors that come in and influence you. And there's other internal psychological factors that influence you. And so at the beginning of the semester, I show this very complicated web or map that kind of shows the decision-making process. And all the students go, oh, it looks so complicated. And it is, but by the end of the semester, we break it down piece by piece and talk about how you know people's culture feeds into things. We talk about how their motivation and their attitudes feeds in. We talk about the perception process and how it's really important to go through both phases of exposure, attention, and interpretation. And by the end of the semester, ideally, the students now have a very solid understanding of we may not have all the answers because there's no guarantees with psychology, mm -hmm. but we certainly now have a better understanding of the different tools and factors at play. And now I can influence this process. Okay, so if correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I remember from class is that um, kind of the purchasing decision uh, differs, say, between buying a car versus buying a pair of jeans. And I guess kind of the biggest difference is um, it carries a lot more weight, um, especially when purchasing a car. So you go through a longer, more complex purchasing decision. Yes, there's a lot of usually. Well, granted, there may be people out there for whom buying a car is a very quick, easy decision. But for most normal people, that is an extensive decision making process. Uh, it takes a lot of cognitive effort to figure out what my options are, then to compare those options and then finally make a decision and then decide what dealership to go to or where to buy it from. And so it's like decisions layered on top of decisions. Buying a pair of jeans, on the other hand, for most people, uh, for me anyway, it's become a habitual thing because I hate going on trying on jeans and shopping. It's a nightmare. So whenever I find a pair of jeans, I just keep buying the same one over and over and over again. Uh, so I don't put any effort into thinking about my jeans until, of course, like the store goes out of business where they stop making them. And then I have a, like a panic attack because I have to go through the whole process again uh -huh. <laughs> of decision making. But that's exactly right. So decision making for jeans is usually a lot simpler, straightforward. There's not as much effort going into it. And so it's harder for marketers and other people to interrupt that decision decision process, you're kind of going from point A to point B, straight line. But other more complicated decisions like buying a car can be a much rougher, tougher journey. And sometimes you don't even end up at the end. You just kind of end up in, you know, and at the beginning. Two years later, you still don't have a car. Right. It's still the same old junkie car. <laughs> okay. Okay. So how do you get inspiration to study these topics? Well, it's kind of a dual inspiration. So mm -hmm. there's inspiration that comes from other research that's already been done. So I, that's how cool I am. I spend my free time reading marketing journals and academic journals and psychology journals. And there's a lot of inspiration that comes from that end, the more academic side. Mm -hmm. But then there's also the inspiration that comes from the fact that I, I'm, actually, I'm a consumer too. So I experience things out there in the world where make, that make me wonder, hmm, <laughs> What, why did I do that? Or why did that other person do that? Or, you know, what's going on there? What's the reasoning behind that marketing decision? Is, is there a reason? Is there research saying, you know, that that's what they should be doing? Or is it the marketers just kind of doing something and making a, an educated guess on something, but we don't really know whether that's good or bad. So it's kind of a combination of real world experience and keeping an eye out for what's been going on in industry and just as a consumer, and then inspiration that comes from prior research. Okay. That's an exciting life. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's my weekends. <laughs> nice. Okay, so last question. I just wanted to know how do you find awe or what's the, the biggest hmm. awe-inspiring moment you've had? Hmm. Well, so one of my biggest awe things is probably nature. So there's certain things that generally elicit awe in people, uh, nature, art, music, uh, other people's accomplishments, those tend to be pretty high in terms of things that, that often elicit awe in people. Nature is kind of my go-to. So it's always been the case where if I go on vacation somewhere uh, or I go home and visit my parents in Washington, where I always try and schedule in an all experience in nature, whether that means I'm going to go hiking up on Mount Rainier uh, or whether that means I'm going to go look at the stars, you know, at night through a telescope with my friends, something like that. I always try and kind of squeeze in some kind of nature awe. So that's a big one for me has always been to kind of seek those out. I know from experience that that's something that commonly elicits awe for me. So I do try and, and seek that out whenever possible. Wow, that's really nice. So I guess that's why you have your screensaver. Yes, to, uh, yeah, that helps. Some of the pictures I've taken myself. And rivers. Yes, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, but it's been fun uh, having lived here in a different part of the country now for a 
several years now because it's all sorts of new stuff that inspires awe. It's different landscapes. A lot more different... heat in yeah, flat lands. Exactly. A lot of heat. There's not as many mountains here, but you know, there's a lot of other cool mm-hmm. stuff to see as well. So it's nice to keep that kind of new and fresh because that's really important with awe is that new, uh, you know, seek out new things, new experiences, new people, new places, because the, that's going to increase the odds that you encounter something that your brain goes, wow, oh, I, I've never seen that or I don't understand that, but that's really cool. Uh, if you're doing the same thing every day, day in and day out, then you're eventually, this, you know, you're going to adapt to everything and it may not be as awe-inspiring. So it's good to get out of your comfort zone and, you know, go explore a little bit. Perfect. Okay. Well, uh, that podcast, I'm sure, gave everyone a lot of awe. Um, So thank you so much for talking with us, Professor Melanie Rudd. And I'm Vivian Nguyen again, uh, and this has been Working Wisdom Podcast with the Bauer College. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Working Wisdom Podcast series from the C.T. Bauer College of Business brought to you by the Working Families Initiative. The initiative aims to provide support and access for women in business school and the workforce and to generate research that organizations can use to implement policies and standards to benefit a diverse workforce. For more information about Bauer College and this podcast series, visit www.bauer.uh.edu slash podcasts.